all our topics are like geopolitics and stuff. Like, mm-hmm. I'm glad we have a podcast with two high school seniors just so we get our perspective on the world. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the most valuable thing people want to listen to. Yeah, listen it's to like, two like 17, 18 year olds just talking it's like, politics. Dude, it's like, fuck, I need to see what Gabe said. Gabe said, think that's, about this that's conflict why they keep in Hong Kong. Yeah. What's going on, guys? Slightly Educational Podcast, Season 2, Episode 2. I'm Seth. I'm Gabe. And. Gabe, I was reading this. I started reading this book lately called "A Hundred Year Marathon" by Malcolm Pillsbury, and it's re- about the um, hundred year plan that China had from the um, basically from the Chinese Revolution in nineteen forty nine to twenty forty nine. Their hundred year plan to seek world domination, and it's pretty fascinating because he was a CIA analyst, mm-hmm. so he had a lot of reports from um, actual members of the Chinese cabinet. That like I feel like in the U.S., like a lot of people like. We're kind of in the dark. We don't really know much about Chinese politics and yeah. basically what goes on in Chinese politics. And uh, the plan, basically the cabinet is filled with right-wing nationalists. Chinese cabinet? Yeah, right-wing nationalists that want to see one goal, which is a un- like not a unified world, but a world, one world under China. You know, mm. it's a big thing in Chinese culture that there has to be like one order, you know, yeah. like one order maintained. And what he's saying is that China... They're all about making your enemy do your work for you. And, you know, so in the U.S., they, they see the U.S. as the, like, the global enemy because we're the global superpower right now. Right. Mm. And it's fascinating because they, like, their whole plan is, like, let, basically let your enemy do your work for you. I mean, they've been doing a lot of work, too, making stuff. Like, yeah. It's, it's, it's but we can get into that. Plan. The uh, one belt, one road. That's another part of their thing because I feel like the U.S., like, we're entering this new era of, I want to say, like, isolationism. Kind of. Kind of. I mean, but like, we're almost going to war with Iran and stuff. So yeah, and that's the stuff that's going to destroy us. Like, you never see China going into war with other countries. Yeah, they just buy the country first. Yeah, <laughs> which is, I think, a smarter idea, personally. Because yeah. I think war just weakens you, you know? Like, regardless of what we get out of going, like, like, do you even know why we would go to war with Iran? I know. Yeah, there's really, like, no reason. Like, regardless, like, war is going to weaken you, it's going to weaken, like, I guess there are instances, like, in World War Two, it kind of strengthened our economy, so we still lost. Maybe it would have, like, destroyed all of Europe. Yeah, so. that's what I'm saying, and you never see China getting weakened by war. And another thing that China, going back to getting your enemies to do your work for you, is that I feel like the United States is in an interesting position with China, where we put so much, like, we pumped, help pump up their economics. Like, if China's economic system is a deflated ball, mm. the United States, not saying we're the only ones that have hit the pump, but we've pumped it up a couple well, times. What do you mean? What do you mean help pump it up? We have what do we invest in, in Chinese companies, allow Chinese companies to invest in us, and, um, you know, just... Maybe. I mean, we've, I mean, we've done a lot more investment in other countries, especially even in Asia, like Japan and South Korea, we did a ton of, ton of pouring in money, and they're doing pretty well right now. But they're not, they're not China. No, China, but I mean, like... I mean, per capita, they're doing a lot better than China. What do you think about China, China's approach, though, to kind of buy out other countries and buy out influence in other countries? I mean, it's pretty... Like, what they're doing is pretty smart. Like, the whole Belt and Road Initiative, where they're mm-hmm. building up, like, infrastructure projects. Mm-hmm. Like, they they build, like, ports in, like... I, I think they saw one in Pakistan. They built one in Pakistan. One in Sri, Sri Lanka. Lanka. Yeah. And the thing is, these kind of these countries can't even pay back these ports. Mm-hmm. So they end up having to, like, lease them to China. Which is kind of ironic, because it's, like, all those leases that China had back in, like, the 1900s. Mm-hmm. Hong Kong and Macau. Yeah. But the thing is, China is, like, they're trying to, because all the ports they're building are in strategic locations. They're on, like, yeah. the eastern side of Africa and, like, southern side of Asia. And I think they're trying to, like, cut off trade. Because, you see, they also, like, they built the first Chinese military base outside of China in Djibouti. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but that's because Djibouti, like, gives away land, like, basically, like, land for free. They yeah. have a ton of port, uh, ports there. Mm-hmm. But still, and, but just, like, the geographic location of it. In other countries, they're investing a lot in Ethiopia and uh, Rwanda. Yeah, I mean that whole like the whole Gulf between like that's like near the Suez Canal, right? So mm-hmm. that's a good choke point for um for anything, whatever they're trying to do. That's what they're trying to do. Yeah, and I don't know. I think that the U.S. should start doing the same. I mean, they're bit. they're pushing back. Like, did you see uh, what's what company okay. is that? Huawei. Huawei. Yeah. yeah, where they like the U.S. like basically like, stopped all trade with like any U.S. goods. Like they make phones, but they can't like use Google's operating system and mm-hmm. they can't use their chips because they can't trade with U.S. companies. So I mean, I I mean the U.S. in terms of that specific relationship, the U.S. has a lot of pe- uh, like leveraging power. Because I mean, even though like Chinese companies like steal intellectual property and stuff, it's kind of mm-hmm. hard to keep doing that on a wide scale. I don't know. Yeah, I guess you're right. I don't know. I just see China because eventually, and let's say some big conflict breaks out, like like some Cold War level conflicts, where countries are gonna have to start taking sides between 
these country and this country with all these like countries china is investing so mm-hmm. heavily and you know they're all going to take yeah china's side if some conflict happens whereas i don't think china um in the u.s will ever wage war with each other i sure hope not i don't think there'll ever be a full-scale war and you like what michael pillsbury said in the book is that china doesn't really want war they want the U.S. to kind of, like, destroy themselves first because they think, like, the hegemon, the world hegemon, is will do whatever it takes. That's how it works, though. like its power. When, when, come, when like, countries, when a lot of these countries fall, they don't fall, like, in the, after, like, a huge war, like the Soviet Union. Like, the U.S. never had to fight the Soviet Union. He just had to bankrupt them first, right? Mm-hmm. So all China has to do is wait it out for the U.S. to do, like, another Soviet invasion of Afghanistan. But they, like, invade Iran, bankrupt themselves or whatever. So, I mean, and plus a war with, like, a war with the U.S. would be, one, really hard to do because, like, separated by oceans Mm -hmm. and two just really expensive for both countries so Mm -hmm. i don't think it would end up well for either do you think the u.s invading iran could destroy the could have the similar effects as like the soviet lead to afghanistan maybe i mean the difference is like obviously afghanistan borders the soviet union Mm -hmm. so all they had to do is just move move troops there it'd be a lot harder to wage like um an occupy or hold an occupation of iran especially iran's a much bigger country too Mm -hmm. And it's not, I don't think it'd be, too. yeah, more developed, and it wouldn't be as popular. Not that it was, like, hugely popular in Soviet Union to invade Afghanistan, but, like, a U.S. invasion of Iran is definitely not popular among people. Mm-hmm. And I think it's odd that the U.S. is even sending troops to Iran, because, like, really, I don't know, I feel like we just have no business being in the Middle East anymore. Like, what are we trying to do? I don't think we ever did, but, yeah, yeah, like, personal. yeah, I don't really think we ever did at all, but, like, what... Now, at least then, there was, like, a goal. Like, there was 9-11, and they were like, oh, these people are attacking us. Right. Like, there was some sort of, like, scapegoat, you know? Right. And, like, reasoning as to why that we why we, we would do that. But now, it's just, like... Well, you just keep making it worse, too. I mean... Yeah. We've already we've already tried to, like, invade or, or whatever, stage a coon around, right? When we set up the Shah back in, like, the 50s, and then mm-hmm. and whatever happened, the Iranian Revolution with the Ayatollah Khomeini. Yeah. Can I say something? Yeah. Um... Do you know Ramsey in our grade? Yeah. The Shah of Iran is his great aunt. Great, great aunt? It yeah. Was a dude, wasn't it? It was a dude, but then he died, and his, like, widow became, like, the head person. And that's Ramsey's great aunt. <laughs> <laughs> that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah. Anyways, I just thought that was weird. <laughs> yeah, but just going back to, like, setting, like, even then, when we tried to, like, we tried to set up, like, a government in Iraq, too. And they, yeah. like, really failed. Or maybe our lack thereof is why it failed so much, because we kind of just left them to their own vices. And I feel like every time we invade the Middle East, and, like, every single person we kill, like, that's someone's, like, father. Like, that's, like, yeah, no, that's going to grow up and be, like, fuck America. And we're, like, why do all these people hate, hate <laughs> the U.S.? Like, <laughs> we're trying to help them. Yeah, I mean, that always happens. Like, obviously, like, there's a the point where, like, I guess you just kill so many people that you can kill whatever, whatever that quote is, uh, when death is tragedy and millions statistic. Right, you start getting desensitized to all these killings and abroad, right? People people like to think about all, like, the U.S. soldiers, right, uh, that come back with PTSD or whatever. Or even, like, movies like American Sniper glorifying and stuff like that. Mm-hmm. But, like, there's people at the other end of those, like, bullets, right? Mm-hmm. People are getting killed, both, Iraq- like, Iraqis and Americans. Mm-hmm. So it's just important to be cognizant of, like, war affects both sides and a lot of neutral bystanders. I know, and I think that's helped create, like... We've helped create ISIS as much as, like, any other terrorist. Yeah. I mean, I mean now that ISIS is not really, like, a threat, I'm just using ISIS yeah. as, like, an example, you know? We helped create that as much, because a lot of people in ISIS are like, yeah, fuck the West, fuck the U.S. Because like, mm-hmm. we just literally show up to these countries and just start bombing them. Yeah, but we also, like, we also help, like, Al-Qaeda with, like, the Mujahideen back when the Soviet invasion happens. Right? We started, like, funding their, bombing their weapons and stuff. Yeah. I mean, maybe, maybe we could do that again back in, uh, what's that, East Turkestan in China? East Turkestan. Start funding some Muslim rebels. Uyghur rebels. I don't know how well that turned out. You know the Chinese are putting, like, concentration camps. Yeah. Like, they're yeah. putting, like, the Uyghur people in concentration camps. I mean, what are you going to do? Are you going to stop them? Like, yeah. No, that's, like, a, one of the problems China has is kind of, like, even with the Hong Kong situation, like, I want to be like, yeah, we should do something about, like, Hong Kong, but it's, like, who the fuck is going to stop Yeah, we should talk about, yeah, that's, I mean, that's, that's been happening this week, That's right? the most, like, pressing is the Umbrella Revolution because of... Uh, right, or, or there was continuation of that, right? Yeah, well, yeah, it started back in the, um... Like, 14 or something? 14. Mm-hmm. And basically, they want the, um, for those of you that don't know, they want to enact a law that would allow people arrested in Hong Kong to be extra Yeah, it was like... China to face China. It was, like, it started out, some guy, some Taiwanese guy was arrested in Hong Kong. In Hong Kong, the Hong Kong government wanted to send him back to Taiwan. But they didn't have like an extradition treaty with them because it's Taiwan, obviously. Why would they have a treaty with them? So they drafted a law that would like allow them to extradite criminals without having needing a treaty first. But then like 
the ramifications are that you could extradite people to like mainland China. Mm-hmm. So people didn't want the, the Hong Kong people didn't want that. And even Taiwan said they don't want the guy back because yeah. would that law would whatever. Mm-hmm. So people went into the streets and um, a couple people from our school actually, or not, well, Justin was there. Was Justin was there at the protest. Yeah, he was. Was he protesting or was he? he was, I mean, if you're there and the protest, you're protesting. <laughs> yeah, but um, yeah, I mean, pro- I think it got like temporary. It's not temporarily not getting passed or something, suspended or something. Mm-hmm. That's that's some progress. Maybe, but like they could still pass it again. And even then, give give it like thirty years in Hong Kong, which would be part of mainland China. Yeah, and the whole like special administrative region. Um, where it's off, which honestly I feel bad for Hong Kong because they have they are not China. I feel like it's called, like Hong Kong. They have their own culture, they have their own language, they have their own currency, they have their own. Yeah, but there, yeah, but there are a lot of places that have their own culture from China. That's not stopping them. Yeah, I know, but Hong Kong is a lot more like has a lot more autonomy than other. Like Hong Kong is a lot more autonomy. Like the Hong Kong people have a lot more autonomy than the Uyghur people or the Hmong people in China. You know? Yeah, no, I know. I mean, that's that's why it was set up that way. But it was purposely set up knowing that it would it wouldn't last. What a fifty years or whatever? Fifty years, yeah. Yeah. So Hong Kong they have until twenty forty seven and Macau they have until twenty forty nine. Uh I don't think we'll ever see any protests like we do in Hong Kong in Macau. <laughs> <laughs> I don't even know like I know a lot of people live in Macau, but I feel like it's just such a no, it's, it's, it's all like, casinos there. Yeah, it's like a resort town. <laughs> But I mean, like, there's, there's not. I mean, there's not much to Hong. What are they gonna do? Like, cede Hong Kong back to the British? That's not happening. I know. Or, or Hong Kong independence. People fight for independence. They'd get their ass. Yeah, that's like nothing gonna happen. Like, even if they crack down, I think they cracked down a little bit, like a couple nights ago, on the protesters. And it's like nothing's gonna happen. It was even what a thirtieth anniversary of the Tiananmen Square protests. Mm-hmm. Nothing, nothing's happening. Yeah, and the thing is with China and with basically any like global conflict, China enters. It's like, who, like, who's gonna slap China? Yeah, no, one, like, no one's going to intervene for Hong Kong. Mm-hmm. Which is sad for the people of Hong Kong. It's actually a decent population. But, I don't know. They're just seeing their rights. Because it's one thing, like, when it was set up, when the special administrative regions were set up, Hong Kong had a lot higher level of autonomy than they do now. They also had, like, a lot higher percentage of the GDP, Chinese GDP. It was, mm-hmm. like, 25% of the Chinese mm-hmm. GDP. No, it was, like, 3%. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> but, um, but still, they had a higher level of autonomy. And now, like, basically, there's no, like, left. Or, I guess... Communist parties, like as far to the left as you can get, but there's no like more like there's more liberal. There's no there's no like liberal party, you know. There's, yeah, like I mean, all the all the guys, all the parties have to be approved, I assume, right? Or mm-hmm. I, I guess they, they do some voting there, right? Like, yeah. And do you know um, what was the name of that kid who was like really famous for the Chinese protests? He was like the poster child of them. Like, I don't bad, the, the first umbrella revolution, not revolution umbrella protests. Joshua Wong. Joshua, Joshua Wong. He was like nominated for like. Um, Nobel Peace and stuff. Does he still live in Hong Kong? I hope I don't know. Yeah. He it does? says here on Wikipedia that he still resides in Hong Kong. He um he was like kind of the leader of it. He was in his own political party called the um uh, Demosisto. Demosisto. Pro democracy organization in China. And that's like a lot of these political parties are forming in China more, like these pro democracy parties, but the Chinese government just shuts it down and it pretty much like arrests and like bars people from running in the elections in Hong Kong, which is kind of fucked because in the agreement that they made with Great Britain, Hong Kong, the Hong Kong people were to kind of govern themselves. Right. And they do hold elections in Hong Kong, but um, they're like elections. Do you yeah. know what I mean? I mean, nothing, yeah, nothing can happen. Mm-hmm. But I mean, like. They can obviously China's been doing pretty well without democracy, right? Yeah, that's how a lot of those countries work. Like Singapore too, like pretty like totalitarian state. But luckily, people are rich, so they don't really care. Yeah, I think it's. I mean, it's different in Hong. It's different in China now because I think the economy's like stagnating. Not that they're not doing that uh, well, but it's like the economy's not growing as fast as it used to mm-hmm. be. So people are starting to get more mad. So, but I don't know. There's nothing. There's not much they can do. I think like the problem with China is that like. I think the culture is just so ingrained into like totalitarian states, because mm-hmm. like whatever three thousand years of With, like the warring states, or even yeah three thousand years of pure rule, and then even after that, when like Sun Yat Sen did the Republic, it was still like they it immediately fell into dictatorship mm-hmm. and stuff like that. And like so, even if like even if the communists lost and the nationalists won the civil war, it'd still probably be a totalitarian state. Yeah. Cause even Taiwan, Taiwan didn't become a republic till like nineteen like eighty something, right? It was like a presidential dictatorship the whole time. And the only reason it became a public is because the U.S. basically like forced it to to get like money, right? So like, Chinese. I think the Chinese are just predisposed. To not not trying to be racist or anything. <laughs> <laughs> but like, I think it's just part of like their culture, just to like 
lead towards totalitarianism and then I don't know, lead to like um author- authoritarian rule because it's how they've been operating. I know, and it's it's there's a lot of like these Chinese like hymns and stuff. I don't know if hymns is the proper word, but like you know what I'm talking about, like mm-hmm. little like proses. Proverbs or something. Proverbs. Proverbs. Yeah. yeah. Um where basically they talk about like one ruler, you know? Mm-hmm. Which for like they're not they're not monotheistic really in China. I think really. they're not religious at all, I don't think. I think most of them are non religious. Yeah. Most of them are non religious or like Buddhist or like Taoist. Yeah, China, yeah, which I don't really know much about those. I think it's like you can practice all three at the same time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but um, there's a lot of these proverbs about like one ruler, mm-hmm. like one world under China. Like that's what China wants. Yeah, isn't I mean that Chinese name for China is like Middle Kingdom, right? Maybe. But yeah, it's very I mean very centralized in the whole state, the whole like organization or structure in place. Mm-hmm. Do you think? Do you like like some of the actions Xi Jinping has taken? Because Xi Jinping is probably like one of the more controversial world leaders. Controversial in the sense that he, like, mm. d- does more things. You know, like, they enacted the... They used to have term limitations for the <laughs> just got rid of, of China. And Xi Jinping just got rid of it. And I don't really know, like, the polling numbers in China, but he seems to be a pretty popular ruler. Yeah, I think... I mean, I think part of being, like, president of China is more, like, in-party faction, factional mm-hmm. fighting. So he had to, he definitely had to, like, do some stuff and take out some enemies to become a president for life or whatever he is. Mm-hmm. So it's, it wasn't easy. Mm-hmm. So he must. You know, he grew up in like a cave. He oh, was like really? a poor man. So was Mao Zedong, though. What? Mao Zedong was also a poor guy. Really? So, I feel like all of those re- leaders like grow up like all of those revolutionaries kind of grow. Well, up. all the, the revolutionaries do, but then after that, like once the next guy comes in, they're all like rich, like generals' kids. Mm-hmm. So like, I, I like I don't know where Deng Xiaoping came from, but I don't know if he was rich or not. But most of these guys after after the yeah, after the first guy, you need like a good story. But then after that, <laughs> it doesn't really matter. You need like something to really resonate with the common people. And then, uh... Yeah, but it, actually, no. So, I mean, some people were rich. Like Karl Marx was rich. He was like a mm-hmm. noble. He was a nobleman's kid. Che Guevara. Was che Guevara rich. I don't know. Mm-hmm. But like, even like, I don't know if Lenin was poor. But I don't think he was. I don't think he was like poor. He was mm-hmm. probably middle class kid. Mm-hmm. I mean, anyone anyone who has enough time to like sit around and read philosophy books about like revolution is <laughs> probably doing well. Yeah, like, probably just well enough to even have books. Like, yeah. if you're poor in some of those countries in, in those times, you probably didn't even have books to read. Yeah, like no one's no one no no one that no poor farmers out there studying like class conflicts. And yeah, stuff except in China, actually, there was a news article I read um, three years ago. I didn't read. It. I saw it in Just Kidding News. Oh, of course, yeah. Comedy news show. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so, I got <laughs> so I mean, like, just saying, Just Kidding News out loud, and then quoting like a news story, and I'm like. <laughs> It may not be the most accurate thing, but there's this um, company in China that was, like, dumping waste on this dude's, like, rice farm. This, like, rice farmer. And he read, like, the Chinese law book. And then took it to court. Took it to the Chinese court and the Chinese law and, like, represented himself, basically. Wow. And got them to stop dumping the waste on his crops. Seriously, probably just moved to the next farm. (laughs) (laughs) Probably. But going back to what you're saying, no poor farmers are reading, um... Yeah. That Das Kapital or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but, um, even in the U.S. too, I feel like most of our presidents and, come from, like, very, like... Yeah, that's not surprising. Backgrounds. But I'd say, like, even in the U.S., a lot of people, like, a lot of these, like, socialists and stuff, people people, people who join stuff like the Democratic Socialists of America... Are, are like, more, like, upper class Are people. rich white people. Yeah. I mean, like, I don't know. Like, a lot of Bernie Sanders supporters, just rich white people want whatever... Mm-hmm. I mean, I shouldn't be talking. I'm a rich Sanders supporter. I'm a rich guy. Too. <laughs> but it's like these new age. Yeah, you're not white. Not, yeah, <laughs> I, got, I got that going for me. But the, I don't know. This new age, like Liberal Party, I think is mostly like there is like a big tier, like upper class liberals, you mm-hmm. know. And um, but yeah, like no, there are no, there are no poor people really, really running for office. Yeah, but I mean that's not to say they don't have supporters. Like obviously, like obviously Mao Zedong was poor, and he had, and his supporters were also like poor farmers or whatever. Jesus was poor. <laughs> he's, he's yeah. he, has lot, he has a lot of followers <laughs> he does probably the most followed person ever but uh but yeah i don't even know what we were talking about it was Mao Zedong or something yeah. oh xi jinping yeah what, what my opinions are on xi jinping he's doing he's doing pretty well i guess for, for like for china i guess he's like his plans the belt and road initiative is pretty smart and all his investments are and he's done a really good job at i guess hiding what like hiding what, no one talks about the uh the concentration camps or whatever mm-hmm. not that there's much to talk about like you talk about it once and then what are you gonna do yeah, but like even even stuff like Hong Kong, right? Who I mean, yeah, Hong Kong is protesting, but like a ton of people can't protest. Like a ton of people in Tibet or whatever, mm-hmm. East Turkestan or whatever, they can't protest. 
because they're like being shut down or suppressed. They don't have a voice because they don't have any no agreements. There's no two systems that they have. Mm-hmm. They're just autonomous, re- autonomous, quote unquote. Autonomous. Semi, I should say semi semi-autonomous, semi-autonomous regions. regions. Yeah, and with all- East Turkestan, Tibet may even have a little more like semi-autonomy than East Turkestan. East Turkestan is basically like yeah. China. And and but they but they keep like but they're they're like moving Chinese people like on Chinese people into those regions. Which I want to know how like how that works. Does the government just like come to your house and they're like, hey, like heard of Tibet? Like, <laughs> I I think you'd be a really good fit. I think, <laughs> well, they start out they build like high speed rails, right? So like super fast trains out to like middle of nowhere in the mountains, mm-hmm. and they like basically like, I guess give out land for free, basically like like the Homestead Act or something. Like what we do with Native Americans, <laughs> yeah. but China's bad guys, so it's, so it's bad when they do it. <laughs> I think it's pretty bad when we do it. Yeah. But that'd be an offer, like, if they were like, hey, Gabe, trying to move to uh, Wyoming, we'll just <laughs> set up a train for you to go there and take, um, get free land. I mean, they pay, like, we do that still, like, in Alaska and stuff, like, they get, like, oil miners and stuff, they get paid a lot to live mm-hmm. there. So I assume that whatever they're doing out in China, whatever, manning the concentration camps, I'm sure they get paid a lot to live in, like, the Himalayas. Because from what it sounds like, it literally is, like, the Chinese government just rounds up a bunch of people. Didn't they do that with the Spratly Islands, too? Did people live there? I don't know, but uh, the Chinese people just like rounded up a bunch of people and started like building these man-made islands where like people. Yeah, that's how that's how they claim land. Like, what's a nine dash line or something? <laughs> yeah, yeah. So that's how they they just dig up sand and dump it in the middle of the ocean so the Vietnamese can't get there first. Yeah, the Filipinos. Yeah, that's what they. That's what uh, Argentina does that too because they. I think there was like they had like a race with Chile. Like they want to be like the only people like the furthest south settlement. Mm-hmm. So like they like put people like in Australia. Oh, they they moved like uh not Australia Antarctica. They moved like a pregnant mom to like Antarctica just to say that you have like the first person like born in Antarctica. So they like, mean born that. in Antarctica. It'd be kind of cool, but it's like what, what, would you get like Antarctic national? <laughs> <laughs> you could represent Antarctica in the Olympics. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Mm-hmm. Probably on flying too. Yeah, but like I don't know. You know, there's a pro- prominent like Uyghur population. In Arlington. in Arlington? Yeah, I remember I got, I feel like such a dick, because this was freshman year. I think we've talked about this on the podcast. Too. Really, where I just started telling this chick that, like, yeah, East Turkestan isn't a country, like, East Turkestan isn't this. Tibet, I feel, like, worse for Tibet, and, um, just because Tibet was, like, such, like, a historic place. It's a like, historic place, but, like, were they, like, ever really independent that often? I don't mm-hmm. think so. I mean, there was, like, a, there was, I know there was a Tibet, like, in the 1900s, but, like, other than that, they've been under China for, like, a long time. Mm-hmm. I know they have their own language, too. But like even like or even like Inner Mongolia too. Yeah, they weren't really. In a, they haven't been independent for a while. They've been part of like the Qing Dynasty, China, or whatever. Well, was Inner Mongolia? Was that ever part of Mongolia back in the day? I don't think it was ever. I mean, it was. I mean, was, obviously, probably like one point was part of the Mongolian <laughs> Empire. Well, there were a lot of Mongols there somehow. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, like I don't. I mean, there wasn't really like a Mongol like state really. Like after uh, Genghis Khan, and then they had the Yuan Dynasty, and then that fell. I think there was like. There was like Ming Dynasty China, so they might have had like I don't, I don't think they had control over Mongolia at the time. Then after like the Manchus conquered conquered mm-hmm. China, then Qing Dynasty, then they took over Mongolia. But there are like a lot of Mongolians. There's actually more Mongolians in Inner Mongolia than there are in actual Mongolia. There's like three million Mongolians in Mongolia. Yeah, there's like fourteen million in Inner Mongolia. Yeah, there's like three Mongolians in Mongolia, and like two and a half, two and a half million of them live in. Uh, yeah. Ulan Bazaar. <laughs> and then the rest of them live in uh, Arlington. Yeah. <laughs> or in like. They, they all live in Roslyn, yeah. yeah they all live at uh, um, the River Place. Place. <laughs> yeah. Dude, River Place is like a Mongolian like settlement. <laughs> that's like that's like Ellis Island for Mongols, because they all they all live there at first and then they all eventually like move out to like other places. Yeah. But then they all end up living they all end up living in like the new like apartments in Roslyn. So they like yeah. move like two blocks down. Yeah. yeah. But no, um, I mean, even Inner Mongolia, like, there's more, there's more Chinese people living in Inner Mongolia than there are Mongols right now. And he, like Tibet too, a bunch of Chinese people are like moving into Tibet. Yeah. Too. So eventually, it's all just gonna be. Yeah. So Chinese. I mean, it, like, so they, it, there comes like a point where like you can't give them independence because what are you gonna do with all the Chinese people living there? Mm-hmm. Right. It's similar to like, like Israel and Palestine. Right. There's mm-hmm. at this point, there's so many, like Israelis living there. Like, obviously, you can't just give all the land back to the Arabs. Mm-hmm. Or same with you, or and Israel smart too because they do like settlements right in like the West Bank, so they can just move people in there and then claim like oh they've been living there the whole time mm-hmm. stuff. So it's I mean it's hard it's hard to do because like you're gonna fault the kids for being born there, mm-hmm. right? It's there's not much you can do there with that. I mean yeah they shouldn't be there. It's illegal illegal settlements or whatever, but like there's not much you can do. Yeah, and um, I think it could get worse too, especially because China just butts their heads into like 
some things, which kind of like uncharacteristically of China is, you know, like cashmere. Mm. China's trying to move like people into the cashmere, which like the most, <laughs> di- that's like telling awesome. me, coming to my door and telling me to move to Tibet is one thing, or even like the Spratly Islands, even East Turkestan, but being like, hey, do you want to move to like the most, one of the most dangerous territories in the entire <laughs> world where like India and Pakistan have been fighting over for years? Like, yeah, they, I'd, they, be little, <laughs> I'd be a little, I'd be a little over that. That's a lot, that's a lot of conflict, because all three, and all three of those countries have like nuclear weapons. I know, that's, that's like, dangerous. yeah, that could like, no, oh, that if if Pakistan, India, and China went to war, that that could potentially yeah. destroy. The but world. I mean, it, <laughs> you can't really march like soldiers over the Himalayas. Mm-hmm. Like you'd have to go all the way around, probably, mm-hmm. or fly. Yeah, I mean, or you just nuke them. And yeah. that's how modern wars are going to be fought, mm-hmm. if if at all. But they're also are they are they doing anything with space? Because uh, China is. I think they're. I don't know. I know they're funding like a lot. They're planning on sending someone to the moon. That's like so are we though, aren't we? Twenty twenty four or something? We are. Twenty twenty three. Yeah, I didn't hear about that. Yeah, NASA like posted a video the other day or like a couple weeks ago now about like we're gonna send another man. We're going back to the moon because it's like a jumping off point for Mars Mm -hmm. and stuff. I think. I mean, I think the fact that they said twenty twenty three one that's not happening twenty twenty four years from now. Mm -hmm. I think it's just like to help like the current administration get like more votes, I guess, because everyone loves NASA. Mm -hmm. They're not gonna fund them more though. So like. It's not. It's probably not going to happen. I think. Yeah. I think if China, like, if I was China in their shoes, I'd be looking to Mars too. Yeah, I'd love that. I I would love a second space race. Yeah, that'd be pretty cool. That would be pretty cool. If it ended up bankrupting the United States, that wouldn't be, <laughs> be as less cool. cool but like, <laughs> <laughs> that'd be pretty cool. Like the race to Mars, the race to build permanent settlements on Mars. That would be such a China thing. Like if you get to Mars and you're the first one, there's already like a thousand Han Chinese people. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Once they build their railroad, there, like, yeah, Han Chinese. One belt, one ast- one asteroid, asteroid belt, belt. One, <laughs> one road. Yeah, that'd be something. That'd be cool. And then the Europeans probably. I think the European Union could do stuff like because they have a lot of money too, and they they try to invest like because they obviously don't have like a joint military, so a lot of their stuff is also like soft power. So they invest in other countries, mm-hmm. obviously not to the same extent as uh, China is, but like if they if they got smarter, they could use all their money. It's obviously harder to organize their funds because mm-hmm. that would be cool. A space EU. race between China, the EU, EU and US, and US basically that'd to be, get to Mars. That'd be crazy. Would you go to Mars? No, I would never go to space, I don't think. Really? Because, like... They're offering... Did you see they're opening up the International Space Station for tourists? Tourists? Really? Yeah, they trust... I would not trust... $52,000 a night, I think, or, like, thereabouts. I wouldn't... I wouldn't really want to go. It looks uncomfortable. Who's taking people? Is it, like, Jeff Bezos or Uh, I forget who. It may be the space station themselves. Oh, maybe yeah, NASA needs money. That's crazy. Yeah. <laughs> I wouldn't trust that, though, because, like, people do weird stuff. Like, like you know all those Chinese people who, like, they throw coins in the engines for good luck? You ever see that? No. Chinese people like I don't I don't know what it is, but like they like to throw coins and engines for good luck, and obviously like that messes up the engine. <laughs> so there are a lot of times where flights have to get grounded because they find coins in the engine and it like messes up the turbine. No, it's not good luck. So yeah, that's like I mean, the most counterintuitive. <laughs> <laughs> Throwing a coin in the engine for good luck, and then you can't even fly because the coin is like clogging the engine. Yeah, but I don't know. I, I mean, I don't know how they do. They, maybe they could have like a. A different segment to the International Space Station. It just looks uncomfortable. Like, you see all those v- videos of those Definitely astronauts, true. like, being in the International... It looks so cramped, especially if you're, like, floating around places. Obviously, like, there is some... Yeah, I mean, I assume they wouldn't have you, like, in the slums if you're $52,000 a night or whatever. Yeah. Um, but, like, slums in the International even, Space Station. <laughs> even the training... For, like, you have, to, you have to get trained to, like, go into space. And stuff. Oh, isn't it, like, intense training? Yeah. Like, like a year. Like I mean, it's, a year of yeah, it's probably more intense for people who actually have to like, fly the stuff. Mm-hmm. But like, even like the amount of like G forces you feel like launching and stuff. And you have to like know the protocol. Like, even on a plane, like you're supposed to listen to like the safety video. Like, imagine the safety video for going to a plane. I mean, uh, into space. I know. And it, like, the, so the thought I just had about astronauts is like, you always have these, um, like when you're younger, one of the most common jobs that someone wants to be is an astronaut. Yeah, astronaut. But do you know anyone that like wants to be an astronaut? Well, I mean, it's really hard to be an astronaut. They can be. Incredibly smart and like really. What's shape. like the field you'd have to take like to astrophysics? Get, get like a PhD. Yeah, astrophysics or like um like aeronautical stuff. So and you just have to be like really smart to do it. Maybe at MIT you'll meet a couple of wannabe astronauts. Yeah, I mean like at MIT like if you're like if you're trying to major in like aeronautical stuff like unless you wanted to do it as like in, like since you're like five like you're not gonna do it. That's mm-hmm. what I've heard. Like everyone in that thing is like has been so dedicated to like aerospace stuff they've been doing it like their whole life. Yeah. That's what I was. Any last thoughts? Did you want to add? 
about China. I feel like I like talking about space. I feel like our next episode should be about <laughs> space. space. No, I think that's I think that's it. I mean, we really digressed away from China a lot. Yeah. But... What are you gonna do? Conversations, conversations. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't really control where it goes. Yeah, I mean, we pick like. We think like all our topics are like geopolitics and stuff. Like, mm-hmm. I'm glad we have a podcast with two high school seniors just so we can get our perspective on the world. <laughs> yeah. that's, that's the most valuable thing people want to listen to. Yeah, listen to like, two like 17, 18 year olds just talking about like, politics. Dude, it's like, fuck, I need to see what Gabe, Gabe said. Gabe <laughs> said, think about this that's conflict in Hong Kong. Yeah. But um, yeah, this is like the educational podcast, season two, episode two. Yeah. Uh, sorry for the the, the, the hiatus month. The hiatus. I think it was longer. Than, the, the time between like season two episode one and season two episode two is like longer than the time between yeah. like season one. Sorry for the hiatus. It's a hectic time of the year. Um, we'll be back. I'm actually going to Texas for the next week. Who? For a week, we go to Texas. So. What are you just visiting? Yeah, Rhett has a lake house. So him oh and I, wow! And him and I are driving there. Driving to Texas. <laughs> yeah. Um, Crazy. Yeah. So I'll be in Texas for the next week, but then after that, we'll be on summer vacation week. We'll Firing episodes back at you. We may even digress from geopolitics a little. Maybe talk about <laughs> like a, the entertainment industry. Uh, you know, we talk about uh, some botany, garden, some botany. Yeah, <laughs> <of course. laughs> that'll get people. Listening. Yeah, that'll really get some viewers. Oh, if we really want viewers, we just need to talk about like fucking like uh, like James Charles, <laughs> like like YouTube drama. Uh, we need we need a sequel to our uh, Vexillology podcast. Oh. <laughs> right. we, we, that'll, that'll, that'll get viewers because you know what's, what's a better topic for a podcast than something you need to see the flags <laughs> <laughs> listen to us describe flags the whole time yeah uh, I think the vexology could get a lot of viewers probably not if we want a lot of viewers we probably have to talk about like who's having sex with who and like it's the celebrity world and it's we could just become a gossip column <laughs> <laughs> it wouldn't even be slightly educational it's just be like none not of this educational. is educational at all like you will not learn anything because I feel like people learn like a little from our pod. Like, no, no, so. I mean, like, like even I learn something. If they if they still listen, like especially yeah. like the beginning of this episode, like you'd have to like you'd have to be listening. For, you'd have to be really dedicated to our podcast to listen to all the way through. Because like the first ten minutes, we're literally just talking about geopolitics and stuff. I don't know mm-hmm. how interesting people find that. Mm-hmm. So if you listen this far, thank you. Yeah, thank you a lot. <laughs> and if you have any recommendations as to what we can do to try and get more listeners, uh, <laughs> <laughs> we've gotten like. Two pieces of feedback in yeah. <laughs> the past like six months we've been doing this. Podcast. Yes, but uh, you know, baby steps, baby steps. All right, I'm peacing. Yeah, uh, take it easy, take it easy, brothers. <laughs>